All right, we're back. We're back with uh, the RVA uh, webinar series. Today's episode is uh, RVA applications for extruded. Uh, I'm Charlie Kaufman. I'm Perkin Elmer's uh, product specialist for ingredient performance products uh, for the food division. Uh, this is an especially interesting one uh, because the people who use it really, really use it and it really pays off. Um, if, uh, if there were one set of applications that I could uh, really go and evangelize for, it would be this one. But like I said, we'll talk about RVA applications for extruded. So um, I'm going to present these with the assumption that uh, the participants in this presentation haven't necessarily seen the other ones. So we're going to do a, a basic RVA overview, talk about why uh, ingredient performance analysis is so important. And then we'll uh, we'll get into uh, the nuts and bolts of the presentation. So, um, as I said, the RVA measures uh, ingredient performance. It's a little robot chef. It heats and cools and mixes uh, according to the program that you designate. And uh, in this way, it really puts uh, that ingredient uh, or ingredient system uh, through its paces. It forces it to uh, perform like it's uh, it's supposed to perform. So it can do things like uh, quantify the effect of uh, uh, heat damage or shear damage, particle size effects, chemical treatments, enzymes, uh, things like that. Um, and it can even go so far as to uh, characterize the molecular weight range of, uh, of certain starches, which uh, uh, we'll talk about a little later. So it's uh, governed by a regular, window, a regular old Windows PC. Uh, it's got super operator-friendly software, and uh, it has been uh, the industry standard tool for ingredient performance uh, for a long time. They've actually been making them since uh, since the early '80s. So it's uh, uh, had a long time for our production group to uh, to perfect, and it's. Um, as close to perfect right now, I think, as, uh, as we're capable of getting. So by measuring performance uh, and quantifying it, then that's a, a key portion of quality control, right? Ensuring optimal performance. So pasting, gelation, hydration, and shear thinning, stuff like that, that has a really big impact on uh, final product quality. So uh, for flour, for example, uh, RVA results can reflect uh, starch damage from milling or heat, uh, relative waxiness of the um, uh, of the source grain, and then pasting strength uh, that has a uh, big impact uh, on finished products like um, uh, noodles and uh, baked goods and extrudates and things like that that we'll talk about today. So it's fast enough to be used as a, a frontline quality tool for flour and baked mixes, and it keeps weird stuff out of the plant. So um, compositional analysis like um, chemical analysis or, or near-infrared optical analysis uh, does not reliably detect um, some functional uh, attributes of the product. And that's why it's important to use something else to uh, evaluate the behavior of the product. I'm going to kind of go through these a little fast because there is a lot of ground to, get to cover uh, later on. So uh, we've said it before, and I'll say it again. Um, we start with the lowest hanging fruit. We start with, uh, with the easiest applications. And that generally means uh, incoming ingredients first. Put on the show properly here. Uh, incoming ingredients first, uh, followed by finished products that are usually shelf stable. Uh, and in the case of extrudates uh, that we're talking about today, um, this is especially true. Um, and then dry premixes, uh, provided they exist long enough uh, to make a decision about them. And then process intermediates, um, if uh, you still want to continue to reduce waste and lock everything else down. So um, for extruded foods, they uh, generally begin life before preconditioning as a dry mix. So all of our usual dry mixing applications apply. Uh, so in one of the previous webinars, we discussed uh, the RVA's ability to uh, detect problems in dry mixing, and um, it, the same holds true here. So things get added twice, things get left out, 
there's a weird incoming ingredient, anything that affects the uh, performance of that system, the RVA will find it almost invariably. And for extrusion applications, it's really important uh, to keep the extruder running uh, as often as possible because downtime is, uh, is really crippling. So if you have to shut down and take the screws out of the barrel, clean the barrel out, clean the die, uh, things like that, that's just enormously expensive. And um, product that's manufactured during uh, startup and uh, shut down uh, around um, uh, the removal of the screws from an extruder is uh, is not good product uh, in general. So um, not only are you down, but you're making bad product uh, for a uh, period of time um, surrounding that shutdown. So um, the viscosity curve that you see with the RVA um, for, with starch, uh, for example, represents uh, changes that are going on at a granular or cellular level. Uh, for these samples. So what you see here are some uh, microscopic images of uh, starch granules. And the early one that you can see in the top uh, left corner of this graph, it's uh, starch granules in their native state. Um, they've been iodine stained. And so raw starch granules exhibit that classic uh, Maltese cross appearance. And um, as you continue to input heat uh, into that starch containing sample, uh, those crosses will generally, will gradually disappear as the crystalline structure of the granule melts. Now, there's no viscosity change associated with that process. It's just the melting of the internal crystalline structure of the granule. And that, if you're being super technically correct, is what gelatinization is. So there's no viscosity change associated with gelatinization. Now, it's immediately followed by the swelling of those granules that you can see in the top center, um, and that's uh, starch pasting. So the granules get bigger and they begin to leach out um, to the surrounding suspension medium, and, uh, and that causes that, um, that increase in viscosity that you can see. So it's kind of like popping popcorn um, or inflating little beach balls, and as you continue to put in heat, the uh, little balls uh, begin to burst and you see uh, a decline in viscosity. So um, all of this happens to a characteristic degree for a given sample. So it really provides you with a behavioral fingerprint of that starch containing sample. So um, as the RVA begins to cool the sample, everything kind of shrinks back together. Uh, it had been hot, so the intermolecular distances were big and it was kind of a, a looser slurry, but as it cools down, everything shrinks back together and gets tangled up and that's the increase in viscosity. You can see here uh, toward the end of the graph. So pasting behavior and gelation behavior have, uh, as you might imagine, big impacts on final product performance. Things like uh, noodles, and, uh, pastry and uh, stabilizer components and things like that. So uh, to the extent that you can lock down ingredient performance uh, and ensure that these kinds of graphs are as consistent as possible for a given incoming ingredient, uh, then it, uh, it always, always pays to do that. So, uh, just another quick note on starch before we, um, before we continue on to uh, the extrusion applications. Viscosity in this context is a function of molecular weight, right? So we have um, two principal molecular components of starch. We have amylose and amylopectin. And amylose is very much a, a small straight chain molecule. It's not very highly branched. Um, it's, it's very much a Lincoln log uh, of a molecule. Um, and then amylopectin is, um, is a big bushy molecule and it um, it uh, has a, uh, a pretty high molecular weight. And so these little straight line amylose molecules, they stack well with each other. They hydrogen bond well um, with each other. And so they form uh, a chemical film this way. And so that lends a, a very crisp, brittle structure uh, to finished food. 
So waxier starches that have a higher amylopectin fraction have um, an inability to stack well with each other. And um, so they don't hydrogen bond well and they don't form film well, but what they do can, they do confer a lot of uh, expansion properties. So um, just imagine if you had uh, the back of a pickup truck, for example, and it was full of uh, small straight sticks, right? And if you were to stand in the back of that truck and jump up and down on a big pile of sticks, you wouldn't encounter a lot of bounce under your feet, right? But as you went to pour them out of the back of the truck, they would all flow out pretty evenly. Um, whereas if you had uh, little tumbleweeds in the back of the truck, little bushes, if you bounced up and uh, bounced up and down on the on the, that pile of molecules, you'd encounter a lot of bounce, a lot of spring, a lot of expansion. Uh, but when you went to pour them out of the back of the truck, then uh, they would all be clogged uh, together and they would all come out in one big clump. So much higher viscosity, and that's very much like. Um, so here you can see the disproportionate uh, effect of waxiness, which is to say higher amylopectin fraction on, uh, on viscosity of the sample. So the purple plot uh, that you can see is in a regular native starch sample, uh, and that's actually three grams uh, of solids, whereas if you have a waxier sample and only two and a half grams of solids, you still get uh, almost twice as much viscosity. So controlling the level of waxiness uh, in a starch sample um, not only ensures uh, consistent uh, performing ingredients, but it ensures consistent final product because you're also controlling the brittleness and the expansion uh, of the final extrudate. And so that's important for everything from breakfast cereal to aqua feed to pet food, extruded snacks, uh, you name it. So just to reiterate, um, it's the job of product development and quality groups to strike a balance uh, between the expansion conferred by uh, amylopectin and the, uh, the film forming crisp uh, properties of, uh, of amylopectin. So controlling the level of uh, waxiness and the viscosity behavior of the incoming ingredients, uh, like I said, really impacts the uh, final product performance. So this is where the RVA comes in. Uh, you can kind of choose your fighter here. Uh, the RVA 4500 has been um, uh, sort of the industry standard for a long time. Uh, and now we've got the uh, RV8 4800 uh, that has uh, some enhanced capabilities to go up to uh, 140 degrees C. So here you're really uh, entering the range of temperatures that are actually present in an extruder barrel. So for starches uh, that might be heat resistant or um, uh, proteins that might be uh, heat resistant before they, they fully hydrolyze, um, this would be a way to observe those ingredients under those conditions. So I uh, won't get into the specifics too much right now, but for more information, of, of course, everything's uh, available uh, on Perton.com. So um, let's talk a little bit about how the RVA quantifies the uh, degree of cook. So how cooked is it? And now that I'm looking at it, I really apologize for this clip art. The 1950s were truly a horrifying time. Um, so we'll talk about uh, barrel cooling and feed rate uh, screw speed effects on the, um, on the overall cook of the product. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about sample preparation requirements at the end, but, um, but where do we start? Well, let's go back to our little starch granules and we'll talk about physically what happens to them uh, during, uh, during cooking, right? So extruders cook starch in two ways. They they cook them in uh, they cook them with uh, heat energy, thermal cooking, and they cook them with mechanical energy, shear cooking. And so here with these electron microscope images, uh, we can see uh, the effects of each one. Right. So in the top left, we have uh, a native uh, raw sample 
of, of cornstarch. And then uh, the, uh, the thermal cooking is represented by the CT, uh, cooking time. Uh, they were held at uh, uh, consistent temperature uh, across all of these uh, across all of these graphs. So uh, cooking time and then uh, shear energy is uh, represented by SE. That that stands for sonication energy, which is a stand-in for um, mechanical cooking here. So in the top center, we can see that uh, there's been some minimal modification uh, to these. We've uh, we've generated some um, some loose particles here, um, but if we keep the um, the cooking time low and then the sonication energy low, uh, then we're we're imparting a minimal cook onto that product. So if we in the top right here, if we keep the shear energy um, consistent and increase the cook time, then you can see that we've uh, predictably um, imparted a little bit more cook. Now here in the lower left, you can see that if we go back to the original lower cook time and increase the uh, shear energy, that has a, a way more drastic effect uh, on those granules. They are um, uh, highly altered from their native state. And that wasn't really the case in the top right. So, how do we affect um, shear cooking and thermal cooking? Well, if you're operating an extruder, you have control over two things, and these things are kind of at odds with each other all the time, always in competition, right? So barrel cooling and screw speed, these are the two things that you have control over, the temperature of the barrel and then how fast the product is moving through the extruder. So if you cool the barrel, then obviously re you reduce the thermal cooking imparted onto the product. But you're creating more friction in doing that. And so you're increasing the shear cooking. On the same, along the same lines, increasing the screw speed also increases shear cooking predictably. And it also decreases thermal cooking because it's spending less time inside the hot extruder barrel. So knowing these two things, these are the two things that we have control over, and knowing the disproportionate effect of uh, shear cooking on the physical behavior of the starch, uh, that makes it especially challenging uh, to sort of drive the extruder in a straight line, right? And um, an extruder, by its very nature, it's you know it's a big, very hot, pressurized tube, right? And by the nature of the thing is to work itself out of specification, so it it needs to be monitored. And the way that you monitor it um, is is with the RBA. So um, just a quick note on moisture effects here. Moisture is protective of a degree of cook, right? So the more moist a sample is, um, the more it's going to seem cook resistant here, right? So here with a small dotted line, you can see that's a native starch. Um, and then the wider dotted line you can see is um, uh, the highest moisture content sample. And it also has it's got a medium uh, barrel temperature, and it's got the highest screw speed of any of the uh, any of the three plots uh, included there. But because it's the highest moisture sample, it exhibits the most uh, raw-like behavior. So there's a lot of data going on here. But what I really want you to take away in the uh, few seconds spent on this slide is that barrel cooling and screw speed changes have characteristic effects on the RVA curve. So this right here, this is the thing that allows extruder operators to look at RVA results and then make educated decisions about changes to extruder settings. So as promised, uh, these, are, these are these amazing 3D models uh, that were uh, created by um, a, uh, as part of a PhD PhD thesis at the uh, University of Nebraska uh, by Dr. Bhima Gira, and um, 
this really allows you to visualize uh, the effects of uh, moisture content, uh, barrel temperature, screw speed, things like that. So as you look at these, imagine that you're looking into a corner and this sort of blanket of RVA results is between you uh, and the corner, right? So if you, um, as you increase the barrel temperature uh, going into uh, the, as you decrease the barrel temperature in, in figure A going into the corner and you increase the moisture content also going into the corner, you, uh, you really increase the, um, uh, the final viscosity of that, uh, of that RVA curve. So, um, like I said, all of these will be recorded and I'll email this presentation to anybody who asks for it. Um, but, but do take a look at this on your own time because they are really fascinating to look at. So, here we're going to see uh, barrel temperature and screw speed effects, right? So, as you move to the left, barrel temperature is going down. And as you move to the right, the screw speed is going up. So uh, you can see that um, uh, for faster screw speeds and higher barrel temperatures, uh, the viscosity is going down. For uh, slower speeds and colder uh, barrel temperatures, then that, that viscosity is going up. And that's consistent with what we saw before with the disproportionate impact of shear cooking. So, um, I don't know if anybody has noticed this, but um, the uh, value-added brands of breakfast cereal that they come in the they come in the bag, and it's clearly designed to imitate um, uh, an, another product from a different brand. They're getting pretty close. They're getting pretty close to the target. This, by and large, is the way that they do it. So you can buy just buy a box of the Target product and grind it up, and you can use the RVA to tell um, what the extruder settings were that produced that product. And so you can manipulate the settings of your pilot process to hit that target. And once you've figured it out, then by golly, you've got it. All you have to worry about is uh, creating it in the right shape and getting a flavor profile right, and that's the easy part. So, uh, almost done here. Uh, how do we need to prepare these samples for dry pellets? It's pretty easy. Obviously, we can just grind them up, uh, control them for uh, particle size uh, to the extent possible. Um, the Purton lab mills are really good at this, uh, especially the hammer mill because it doesn't impart uh, a lot of additional heat uh, to the sample. If it's uh, if it's a wet pellet or if it's a preconditioned dough, you're going to want to freeze that and um, uh, minimize any kind of retrogradation effect to uh, to represent where that uh, where that product was in the cooking process uh, at that particular moment. So went a little bit over time today, but uh, just to remind everybody that this presentation, along with every other one in the series, is recorded. All right, boys and girls. Well, thanks everybody for uh, joining us again, and uh, I will see everyone uh, next week. I hope. Have a great week and uh, we'll talk to you soon.